Welcome to the study, Sectarianism is Sin, a study by a Christian soldier. The Sin of Sectarianism First, let's define the word sectarian. Let's see what this uh, points to. Uh, a member of religious sect. No, here we go. Let's read this part right here on number three. A person who is blindly and narrow-mindedly devoted to a sect. Sectarianism. Oh, here's a good one. A dissenter from an established church. Dissenter, huh? Let's see what another website says. Sectarianism. Sectarian spirit or tendencies. Excessive devotion to a particular sect, especially in religion. Very interesting. Sectarianism. Bigotry. Discrimination. Hatred. Arising from attaching importance to perceived differences between subdivisions within a group. Sects. Groups. It's human nature, but but is it right? Let's take a look. Let's see. What does the Bible say about sectarianism? This one verse should destroy all sectarianism. Everything. Let's see what it says. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. I'm using the, uh, the New King James just to make it a little bit easier for, for you guys. Sectarianism is sin. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly join I'm, I'm sorry, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household that were, I mean, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So, a Pharisee of Pharisees, Paul, is very clear he's writing to the church of the Corinthians. And he's saying that there should be no division amongst any of us. Because Christ is the one that died on the cross. Through him we get the salvation. In Christ alone, through faith alone, period. Let's see what. Why use the Bible? We're attempting to shed light on a subject that pertains to biblical fact, practice, doctrine, and Christian believers and their training in righteousness and understanding of God. The Bible is a book that many sectarians used to come up with their ideas and interpretations. Let's see if their ideas came from the Bible and from God or came from their own human intellect and or imaginations. The Bible canon is the standard for measuring all matters of the Christian faith. Maybe some of you know this, maybe some of you don't, but let's review. Bible canon, what does it all mean? Canon, definition. Canon comes from the Hebrew word ganeh and the Greek word kanon. Both signified a reed or measuring stick. Definition of canon. There it is again. Two separate sources.
As believers of God, we should understand that we need to follow certain rules. Obedience to God begins with humility. God resists the proud. Here are some verses that you can pause and read on your own uh, to see that God resists the proud. You can go on here and pause the video and look these verses up yourself. God resists the proud. In this case, God is the creator and author. God set the rules and authored the rule book. Let's see what this says. Creation. To create is to cause something into existence, not through natural evolution, but from one's own thought or imagination as an invention. So the very definition of creation gives credit to God. God inspired the Bible. Here we see the definition again, the action or process in bringing something into existence. Oh, look, interesting, the bringing into existence of the universe, especially when regarded as an act of God. The meaning of the message comes from the creator and author. The creator knows the intended meaning. The believer presupposes God to be the creator of the universe and also the creator of the meaning and purpose for his creation. God is the author of the message and knows the intended meaning of that message, objectively and absolutely. The meaning comes from and was created by the creator, author, and is not up for interpretation by the audience or reader. That's subjectivity. That's not what God wants. To stray away from the creator, author's intended message is dangerous and can lead to misinterpretations. Let's look at the term meaning, since it's important to understand the intended meaning that the Bible contains. Meaning. What is intended to be or actually is expressed or indicated, significant. The end purpose or significance of something. Hmm. Very interesting. How do we know what God has said? Well, we have the scripture and the concept of sola scriptura. How can we be sure to know the intended message from God? If God left us this amazing canon of books and revelations, how can we know what he's trying to say? Well, we have hermeneutics, the art and science of interpreting the Bible. It seems that even the world knows better. Let's see what this says. Copyright means the exclusive right subject to the provisions of this act to do or authorize the doing of any of the following acts in respect of any of, of a work or any substantial part thereof. Maybe you don't understand that right now, but we'll go back to this concept of copyright. Let's see what some worldly intellects have to say about interpretation. Before speaking, consider the interpretation of your words as well as their intent. This is just part of communication. Even worldly men, flawed men, understand. Let's read it again. Before speaking, consider the interpretation of your words as well as their intent. Let's see what this other guy has to say. The art of interpretation is not to play with what is written. Let's get back to the topic at hand. The sin of sectarianism. This 
Bible verse is very clear. Is Christ divided? He shouldn't shouldn't be divided. We should all be in one accord. This scripture alone should end all nonsense of Calvinism and Armenianism and isms and this and you know it says it very clearly. Am I of Paul or am I of Apollos? Am I of Cephas or am I of Christ? He says it very clearly in this in this passage. Reading into something that isn't there. Second Peter one twenty says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. This one too should be enough for the cults to put away their misinterpretations. Speaking to the uh, Mormons, <laughs> and well, you know what? Speaking to every other cult. Let's use some logic and reason. What do we know? The Bible was written over 1,500 year span, over 40 generations, over 40 authors from many different walks of life. Kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, scholars. Who wrote the Bible? You can go on and pause this and read this yourself, but the point is that the Bible contains God's intended message. God's word can be studied and scrutinized, and there is a consistent message throughout the books. That is a miracle and shows divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit of God. Sticking to the intended message as God planned to communicate objectively, not trying to make up your own subjective interpretations. God's message was conserved in the Bible canon, and we should strive to continue to conserve that miraculous, cohesive message. This is clear enough for me right here. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Think about that scripture for a moment. Maybe go back to it later. Sticking to the intended message is conservative. Let's see what that means. The word conservative, aiming to preserve. Conservative principles, the disposition and tendency to preserve what is already established. Opposition to change, the habit of mind or conduct of a conservative. Let's see what it says here in the Latin breakdown. Aiming to preserve. Hmm, interesting. Stick to the intended message from God. Conserve to keep and protect from waste, loss, or damage. Preserve. Does Calvinism follow the established rules in the Bible? Does Calvinism stay close to sola scriptura? Is Calvinism in the Bible? Can we use logic, some logic and reason and hermeneutics? Let's take a look. What is Calvinism? Calvinism, also known as Reformed Theology, is a movement within Orthodox Protestantism. See, I'm just going to stop there. Calvinism. Are we of Calvin? Are we of Paul? Are we of Apollos? Immediately, this should point to that. 1 Corinthians passage that we should not be of Calvin or of Luther of or of this or of that, that we should be of Christ. That was developed by John Calvin, blah, 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 
Okay, let's see. Calvin was a lawyer. Became a pastor. Hmm. Okay, let's read. Whoa. Wait a minute. Reformed theology? To conserve or to be conservative? Let's go back a little bit. To conserve is to oppose change or reform. Conservatism. Conservative principles. The disposition and tendency to preserve what is already established. Opposition to change. Opposition to reform. Let's see. The established rules, teaching, and guidelines were already set by the Creator, God Himself. So Reformed theology is not conserving the already established message and miraculously consistent and cohesive message from God Himself. Contradiction not only shows that the Holy Spirit was not with this doctrine of Calvinism, but also breaks the laws of The law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction. This is the law of logic. The same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject and in the same respect. So Calvinism cannot be contradictory to the Bible and also still be part of uh you know the the bible's cohesive message calvinism cannot be both biblical and not biblical we've seen some of these uh, apologists argue exegesis exegesis means to bring out the meaning of a text as it was intended by the original author could any jew or first century christian those were initially also Jews, come to Calvinistic, Calvinistic-like conclusions? Or would anyone else in the Bible? The Bible was written for believers of God, Yahweh, Yahuwah, whatever you, will you, uh, you stick to, to the name. The God of Adam and Eve and all other humans that came from them thereafter. We believe that God created Adam and Eve literally, and had a personal, physical, emotional, spiritual relationship with both of them. God told them to be fruitful and multiply, and pass down the correct, conservative, truthful knowledge of God to their children. Adam and Eve were eyewitnesses of God, and were told immediately upon their creation how and why God created them. God gave the meaning He created for our lives. Let's go back to the concept. The meaning comes from the author. If God would have intended Calvinistic ideas, those ideas would have been crystal clear, obvious, objective, and prevalent in the teachings, doctrines, culture, and scriptures from writers in the ancient books, and would also be still be visible in today's Jewish culture. Sadly for Calvin, these ideas are not. And the Pharisee of Pharisees is very clear to the Corinthians. Sectarianism is sin. That should put away all sectarianism immediately. Let's see what 2 Peter 3.16 says. <clears throat> As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. As they also, the other scripture, oh, I'm sorry. As they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter is clear about that too. Reading into something that isn't there. Let's go back to this concept. Second Peter 1.20 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. 
If it contradicts the word of God, it is not from God. Let's look at one verse that inspired Calvin for his ideas. Verses used to justify total depravity. I'm sure that that I can presuppose that that those of you watching this video understand what Calvinism proposes, and I'm sure you guys understand tulip. So let's take a look at this verse that that supposedly justifies total depravity. Genesis 6, 5 in the, King, in the King James Version. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Hmm. Looking at Genesis using hermeneutics. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Who was he writing for? The Hebrews that left Egypt and for every generation thereafter. Literal context. Moses wrote for the Hebrews to understand and know God as he had revealed and bore witness and testimony for himself and how he had created everything and given humanity the message to propagate to all humanity thereafter. Historical context. To give the people a history of the creation and the history of Adam up until their time. The time of the people wandering in the desert. Synthesis and application for us today. God, the self-existent and self-revealing one, wants us to see the pattern of God creating, man rebelling, God punishing the sin, and God forgiving and redeeming humanity back to himself by his amazing power. And for that, we should fear and respect and obey him. Continued dissection of Genesis 6-5. Synthesis and application for us today. Genesis 6-5 shows us the result of the eternal battle between the kingdom of the enemy and his fallen angels and the kingdom of Almighty God. <laughs> I misspelled the enemy's name. <laughs> The enemy's insistence on interrupting uh, interrupting plan for God's creation by corrupting the flesh, by interbreeding angel and humans, also rebelling against God's design and order. We see that God put a stop to that corrupted wicked flesh, punished the sin, but set aside his faithful servants and remnant to continue his plan. We learned by example, and we should strive to walk in fear and trembling of God, because he can destroy us for our wicked flesh and our soul. But despite our rebellion, God loves us and wishes to save us and reconcile us back to himself. And that we should see the severity of sin, repent, turn away from it, live set apart for God, and abstain from sin or rebellion. By obeying God, blessings will come. And he is the author of our salvation. So let's see. Total depravity? <laughs> it seems that total depravity is not so total after all. In Genesis, uh, in Genesis uh, 6, 5, total, defined as compromising the whole number or amount. Calvinism, Calvinism says that all humanity is completely, absolutely, totally depraved. But Genesis 6-9, Noah was described as a perfect man. The original Hebrew word is Tamiyim, Strong's uh, 08549, which means without blemish or unadulterated. So total depravity that doesn't seem to be total comprising of the whole number of humanity because Noah is said to have been perfect was God going to wipe out humanity for their sins Noah was found drunk by his son drunkenness frowned upon by God so was Noah perfect blameless 
unadulterated, if he had been drunk? And what made Noah blameless before the Lord? Jesus had not yet come at that time for Noah to have been redeemed of sin. But the main point is that Genesis 6-5 does not completely, wholly, totally teach of the entire humanity being totally depraved. Because Noah... Noah blameless and not totally depraved. Genesis explains the genealogy from Adam to Noah. We see that the lineage was of people walking with God. Adam experienced the truthful testimony from God revealing his work. Since we believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we can appreciate that Adam had three witnesses testifying to the testimony of God concerning creation. Adam taught his sons and daughters Sorry that I left that out. The ways that God had established. Genesis 4.3 And in a process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flocks and to the end of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. So here we see that Adam passed on conserved God's message to his to Adam's offspring walking with God in the opposite of depravity the Bible describes men that walked with God and were conserving and passing down God's message and laws given to Adam all the way to Moses who brought it all together and gave us Genesis the many blameless or righteous men described shows that they were not they were not totally depri depraved oops that's a that's a typo as calvinism presumes the old testament men did not have their forgiveness of sin through faith in jesus christ the promised messiah from from even from the very beginning of genesis 3:15 all the way to jesus actual birth ministry death resurrection and ascension so how could they have been drawn to god Cal calvinism says that man is incapable of even initiating a search for god so how were those other men blameless or righteous or walked with god if calvinism says that they're incapable of initiating of even initiating a search for god how, how then did those men that were not totally depraved, but righteous, come to God and walk blamelessly for him? Noah is said to have been perfect. That doesn't describe total depravity at all. Because they were preservers and propagated the conserved message of God. In the scriptures, there is no mention of how God came to those men or how God made those men blameless. Actually, the opposite is presented, that those men were blameless. Of what we can assume is their own free will and the love and fear of God. They continued in the path, Adam, the eyewitness of God, and the message he passed down. Let's look at the verse again using hermeneutics. Again. Genesis 6-5 And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay, we go back. Who wrote it? Moses. What was it written for? The Hebrew Israelites. The Hebrews, Israelites. Well, it wasn't the Israelites, but it was the Hebrews. To know the history and testimony of God's self-revelation to his creation and how God created man, sinned, rebelled, God punished, then redeemed and set aside his remnant for himself, Noah, and to preserve humanity and his faithful conservative servants to continue his message and plan for humanity. Historically, speaking specifically about the humans living in that specific time who were wicked and also defiled from the interbreeding of angels and the daughters of men. Not speaking of all mankind as a whole, of all generations, of all time, past, present, and future. 
as Calvinism supposes. Already that scripture fails Calvinism. It is not teaching Calvinistic doctrine at all. Genesis 6-5 in context. The wicked, or totally depraved men as Calvinism presumes, spoken of of the ver spoken of in the verse those will die not because they are totally depraved but because of the unholy union of angels and the daughters of men that mated oh i'm sorry the angels that mated with the daughters of men as the enemy attempted to interrupt god's plan for the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent the enemy attempted to corru uh, to corrupt the human race with bad seed so that the seed of the woman from Genesis 3:15 would never be so Calvinism failed to conserve the message and meaning in context which came from the author creator the meaning comes from the author not the reader that's eisegesis and not exegesis if not in agreement with the established scripture, it is not from God. God's word or nothing. God's rules or law. Let's go back to canon. A general law, rule, principle, or criterion by which something is judged. So, does the Bible scream Calvinism? No, it doesn't. Calvinism has taken things out of context to justify their twisted, reformed, man-made ideology. Since Calvinism uses Genesis 6-5, but it is horribly out of context and teaching a doctrine that is not in the text, and it is contradictory to what God's intended message and known established character of God to be, also considering that reformation that came later by a man's interpretation is to be opposed remember conservative conservatism is to oppose reform or changes here we see right there Con conservation is to oppose new changes reform reform reformation means new changes changes clearly not from god should not be taught and should be stopped. Jeremiah 23:16. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are professing to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. Going back to the definition sectarian spirit or tendencies excessive devotion to a particular sect especially in religion we can say that this excessive devotion is in calvin and it is sinful it is idolatrous beware of false prophets Calvinism should not be taught or spread the sin of sectarianism. Part 2 coming soon. If this didn't convince you, maybe the next one will. Check the so-called Calvinist justifications in the scriptures using hermeneutics. Here's a verse that I'll leave with you. Luke 16, 14 through 15. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at Jesus. And they said to them, and, and Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. <laughs> 